Doctor Adam Jenkins. Ah, huh? <laughs> I'm not a doctor. No, no you're a doctor. A I'm doctor. a moodler, not a doctor. Damn you're it. a doctor. Uh, well, that's what it says. That's what it says in in today's description. So thank you very much for oh, your oh, today. Doctor. Doctor. <laughs> doctor. Okay, I can accept that one. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I want to talk to you about the whole. There you go. There it is. Uh, the whole Moodle thing, and the whole open source thing, and um. I wanted to start with something that uh, you told me. Uh, oh gosh, now I mean it's a few months ago, but it was very surprising actually. Um, you were never uh, you're a, you're a, you're um, a trained educator. Your degree is in education. Oh. Yes. Yes. But yes. everybody knows you as this 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 uber technical sort of open source guy. So how did you make that journey from being a teacher to being somebody that knows? that is known mostly for his technical skills? Uh, it was an accident. Um, simply, wow. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Um, <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, yeah, the, the story is basically, sort of starts when I was at, um, starting to teach university part-time back in the early 2000s. And, I just didn't have enough time contact hours with the students. I would meet them once a week for 90 minutes and that was it. And I figured for their English education, that's not enough. Mm. And so I wanted to keep them going, doing stuff, assign homework. They'll wait until, you know, 20 minutes before the lesson to do it or something like that. They'll, they'll do it as a rush in the one uh, night beforehand. But I wanted to have them have this steady drumbeat of a little bit of study at a time. And the only solution I could see was to uh, put some content online so I can track it throughout the week and uh, make sure that they are continuing to come back and revisit the content throughout the week. I set up a little BBS sort of a thing. And then I think it was Kevin Ryan. He came to Hamamatsu for a Hamamatsu Jolt presentation at one stage. And he said, well, why don't you use Moodle for that? I don't know why didn't know what Moodle was. So I looked into it, um, <laughs> double clicked on it and it didn't do anything. And then from there just learned, oh, you need a server. Oh, you need this. Oh, you need, oh, okay. Um, so it all just grew from there. Did you know what a, like, you know, I mean, it's it's almost ludicrous for me to think to ask you, like, do you know what a server is? But the, the past tense, at that time, were you as technically savvy as you are now? Did you, did you know what a server well, was? Well, it's a it's absolutely a true story that I went to the Google site, downloaded it, and double clicked it, expecting it to do something. Um, <laughs> so that that's how um, completely clueless I was back then. Wow. So, so now you're. I mean, just just to put this into context for everyone, because um, I mean, I'm nowhere. I'm nowhere near as technical as Adam is, but. When I need to, and people know me as somebody who knows a little bit about computers and stuff, but when I need to know something in depth about anything on the internet or anything, when it comes to computers, really, I ask Adam. So if mm. people think, oh, well, I'll ask Jose, he'll know. Well, there's an awful lot of things I don't know, but I'll ask Adam. See, you didn't know anything about setting up mail servers or setting up security or anything. It all stemmed from this. And from then on, it was just every time I ran into a problem, Google it. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that I was completely helpless, although I was hopeless. Uh, but there are communities out there like the Moodle Association of Japan and the greater global Moodle community and, um, you know, the open source community for Linux and um, Apache projects, the Nginx projects, all of these projects are filled to the brim with people just urging to, you know, really, really wanting to help people. And so there's no absence of help out there on in cyberspace regarding especially, um, you know, computing related stuff. So I just solved one problem at a time. Oh, mail's not going out. How do I fix that? And then it was just one at a time. It wasn't that I suddenly acquired all the knowledge. It was just a bit at a time. How did you find your outlook on education, teaching, classroom tactics uh, evolve as you came to gather all of this information? Did you think, I never knew you could do that, 
hey, how does that apply to what I was doing before? Maybe I should do this. Did you find there was an evolution that was caused by the technical information that started to um to to come to you? Uh, not really, um, which I guess is kind of strange. But perhaps it's just that when you're in it and you, you know you're the the frog slowly cooking, you you don't notice that the water's getting hotter. Uh, probably not the best. Analogy. Maybe not. <laughs> That's good. Well, well, but when you're going through it, though, you probably don't notice it as much as, you know, if somebody from the outside is seeing you start at zero and then go to 100% and then go, oh, wow, that was a massive change. And for me feeling it, I didn't really feel it that much. But the, the things that I think I'm noticing in other people now post pandemic is other people coming on online and saying, you know, things like, it's not um, online or offline. It's all education and we're all just using different tools to achieve the educational goals. And so um, I think it was even David Juto last week was uh, saying you know, something like, it's not so much online teaching Japan as it's teaching Japan. And it's, it's all part of a, a greater whole. I sort of already started out with that uh, mentality because I was looking for something to just add on to another tool to add on to my 90 minute a week uh, lesson. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something that I was, oh, I'm going to do online teaching only or something. There was never that, um, that consciousness in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the pandemic itself, did that, did that affect or, or how did that, I'm sure it did affect, but how did that affect your outlook on, on education or, um, how technology can help you uh, solve your problems. First of all, did you did you spend most of your time online during the pandemic, or are you in the classroom mostly? How would did your <laughs> university handle that? We we had the the first semester was all online of the pandemic, so um, spring semester twenty twenty, and then we've been in the classroom face to face ever since. Uh, so we had perhaps this at my school, we had the smallest possible amount of online teaching that there could be. Uh, that said, when we went online, one of the things I do remember is how um, many people would say, oh, we're all struggling to do this. And I was thinking, I'm not really struggling that much. Mm. Um, and that's, I mean, I think around about that time was when uh, I started talking to you about the concept of rat. Right, the reduced and altered, altered tool set teaching in that, yeah, some of my tools like the classroom, the whiteboard and face-to-face mm, -face group work have disappeared. But the other tools of uh, say Big Blue Button and Moodle and uh, breakout rooms and you know those tools remain. And I'd made extensive use of those tools before the pandemic. So when the pandemic struck and those tools remained available to me, well, losing these other tools was not such a big hit as it probably was for other people. Uh, I'm just trying to sort of um, find a way to segue to the other stuff we want to talk to. My, my mind is moving in so many different directions because there are so many topics that I want to talk to you about. Uh, and I have to let somebody into the room right now. Um, in, in terms of where you see uh, RAT and the other acronym that eventually I think we're going to probably introduce either here or maybe at uh, Matsuyama Jolt uh, when we uh, talk mm. uh, in front of Linda's crowd is um, ETT, mm. uh, Enhanced Toolset Teaching. Uh, what's the difference between those two? Because those are two very important acronyms to you, I think. Uh, the biggest difference is whether there's an, a reduction or an addition. If... Um... You know, through the reduction of, of having our tools, having our classrooms taken away from us as, as an educational tool, we were forced to adopt new tools to make up for the, for the gap. And so people started learning about Zoom, Moodle, and, and uh, Edmodo, and Manaba, and you know, all sorts of different tools, uh, Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom, just to supplement what used to be a pretty, we, we thought of as a pretty complete educational landscape. And then after that, well, okay, we're, we're approaching where, dare we say it's post-pandemic, but we're approaching that stage. We're back in the classrooms. We have the original tools back now, largely. Mm. So what do we do with these new tools that we picked up when those tools weren't available? Do we just drop them? Well, 
a lot of people seem to be very reluctant to do that because they're saying, oh, we can actually still get some stuff done with these. Um, so if you actually keep them, but think, how can I actually use both of these tool sets together for the best possible outcome for my students? That's enhanced tool set teaching because you've enhanced your tool set for your teaching. What did you see that required a different acronym, Enhanced Toolset Teaching, as opposed to um, a more established acronym about ed tech in the classroom, which <clears throat> is the SAMR model, and then something else that you talk about too that's related to that, which is the, the SUDSE model. Mm -hmm. um, SD, S, SDCE is SUDSE and SAMR is S-A-M-R. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to talk about that right now, or we can talk about that later, but um, I, I thought that that was a good place to talk about it. It's going from RATT mm -hmm. to ETT, uh, and, and then there's this other sort of uh, bubble in the Venn diagram of SAMR to, uh, to Sudzi. How, do, how does that all overlap in this Venn? Mm. Well, um, the, the RAT uh, concept was actually more of a reaction to emergency response teaching or um, the, the concept of being an emergency that needs to be overcome and once it's overcome, it's dropped. Mm. Um, I, I found that emergency response teaching also seemed to have had a, an element of say learned helplessness to the situation. Mm. Whereas we can't improve. We can't be the same. We, we can't maintain the same quality We're we're hopeless. Ah, and it seemed very giving up and very, it, it didn't seem like a positive mindset to have going into a pandemic. Uh, whereas RAT was a bit more empowering because yeah, your, your tool set's reduced. Uh, your tool set has changed. You've got to use different tools, but you can use these different tools and you are able to search for new tools to enhance your uh, current teaching, which has been taken a big hit from a COVID pandemic. Mm. So it wasn't as related to Samur and Sudzi just at that point. Mm. Um, the relationship to Samur, I mean, Samur is an, an awesome model for looking at your online teaching practice and saying, hey, am I using this uh, for its strengths? If you're, you're looking at how you're using EdTech, if, if, how you're using, uh, say, an online quiz or something, are you actually using it to its strengths? Well, you know, substitution, if you just give them one, give your students one shot at taking a quiz and that's it, or maybe you're not using it for the best strength that the thing can, because the machine can do the marking automatically and it can allow students to have multiple attempts and provide automated feedback to the students. So those augmentations and modifications can make the task a lot more uh, it gives you more bang for your buck. Right. Um, so those sorts of things, okay, the, the machines are more uh, appropriate tools for that particular learning activity. And I think quizzes, for example, are a great example of something where online is always going to be better than offline for quizzes. Hmm. So not talking about for, um, for say, speaking practice or something, that Speaking practice, you're definitely best best place to do that's in the classroom, sure, where they've got another student right beside them that they can talk to. But you should, your, your online stuff can actually be, the quizzes is going to be better online because of this repeated attempts thing. So how about, this is an idea, let's get the stuff that online does really well, let's put that all online. And the stuff that in classroom, you can only do in the classroom like you know, pair work speaking, like uh, VC. Let's do that in the classroom and maximize the amount of time in the classroom available to that. That I think is um, how SAMR uh, really sort of affected me. Mm. And then you moved on to a, a different model, one that you built up mm. yourself that was specific to helping people understand LMSs, uh, mm. which I believe I will show right now, if you don't mind. I, I oh, sure. sort of get on got onto this topic a little uh, earlier than I thought we would, but um, uh, you're on a roll, man. You're, you're doing well, great. Keep I've, got a, <clears throat> I've got a sort of an, a newer image than that. Maybe I could show the newer oh, image. that would be better. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that? Okay. Uh, 
While he's doing that, I will remind everyone, as I always do, that if you uh, want to just hang on for a little bit, uh, we'll be able to uh, get to uh, your questions in a little while. Get ready to push the, the reactions button for raising your hand so I know who's first. Uh, for the people who are in Facebook right now, um, I'll try to keep an eye on your comments and questions in the Facebook thread, and I'll try to get them up to Adam as we go. Yeah. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so the Sudsy model was um, basically it's not a replacement of SAMR or anything like that. It's just SAMR was, uh, is a good model for uh, assessing how well you're using the ed tech for the ed tech's strengths. Whereas the Sudsy is more answering the question of where should I start and how can I go? It originally came out as uh, Bill White's here tonight, uh, this morning. Uh, okay. And <clears throat> it's nighttime somewhere. And uh, he, he actually had a conversation with me one time where he said, he asked the question, well, how, what is beginner Moodle was really the, the crux of the question that we got to in the end. What is beginner Moodle? Because Moodle is just one big collection of tools. And so if you were to perhaps limit the accessibility of uh, all of the tools to just the beginner stuff, what would you actually do? What would that smaller tool set for beginner users of Moodle, what would that look like? Instead of having this big activity chooser with, you know, 50 tools, let's let's limit it down to say three or four so that uh, beginner users don't find it so hard, don't find it such a, a steep learning curve to actually get into. And so in answer to that, uh, we said, okay, well, let's look at what makes it difficult. And what makes learning Moodle difficult? Well, first of all, there's technological difficulty, logging into the site and finding the content. Um, so if students are shown something that they can just log into and see, that's gonna be perhaps the easiest thing that we can, uh, we can expect our students to do. And that's uh, the static level of subject. And these are not levels in terms of, um, uh, you know, you have to complete one before you move to level two, you have to complete that before you move to level three. There are levels in terms of scaffolding um, so that if you have a solid base of static content, then your dynamic stuff is more likely to succeed. Hmm. So after the static stuff where students just look at stuff, this is, they just look at an image. They just look at a document. They just listen to an audio file. They just um, access a web page because the link is on the LMS. That's about as simple as that gets. That moves on to the dynamic stuff where uh, there are quizzes and stuff like that and students submit their answers to the system and the system grades them. That's more dynamic content. And that adds a little psychological layer to it because um, you know, nobody likes to complete a quiz and have the big, big red F come up and say, you failed. Nobody, there's a bit of pressure there. And that pressure is going to make it a little bit harder. It's easier to just look at stuff than it is to, um, to do stuff. If you add a communicative element, then now students are talking to other students and this raises the stakes because there's a social uh, aspect where students might look like a fool in front of their fellow students. Nobody wants that. So if they're not competent in users of the technology and they're not competent in their ability to actually interact with the system and do things the right way, then the social pressure is going to build up and, and push them over the top and they won't yeah. be successful. And explorative just adds a more privacy aspect of that as well, where you're exploring the student's realm. And uh, that means the students actually got to really not just talk with people, but bear their inner soul to them. And of course, that's going to be a little bit more challenging. Um, and it's kind of surprising, but sometimes we try to do explorative type stuff in the first class and it often doesn't work. And uh, this model sort of explains why. So. Mm. Mm. So it's interesting that um, I've, I've never thought about it that way before that like um, <laughs> you, you have to do it in steps uh, within the classroom itself. I, I see this chart as, as something that a teacher does um, in their own professional development, that eventually, you know, they they become they become an explorative teacher. They encourage students to be explorative from the very beginning. Um, the idea that um, you have to begin um, to to scaffold the students as well too is uh, is something I never thought of, and that's um, I think that's really important. Also, you wanted to talk about um, how the scaffolding 
of educational technology for educators themselves is something that you felt was an important thing to touch on. And I think we all experienced that a lot um, through the pandemic, and we watched it happening almost real time with online teaching Japan, uh, how people needed or, or were at different levels of, of ability with their computers or with, uh, with the internet, uh, with LMSs. But how do you see that uh, uh, out of your pandemic experience? Well, um, <clears throat> indeed, the, the Sudsy model was essentially developed not so that I can scaffold my own teaching, but because I had a need to train other teachers. And when I was doing this and the other teachers, of course, are going to come at me with that question again. Well, what's the beginner stuff? And if I say, OK, go straight in and make a quiz. Well, that's pretty challenging because you've got to get con you've got concepts like the, the question bank and how to actually make a good question that can be marked automatically. What are the benefits of marking it automatically and things like that? Samra model they don't know about. So teachers are... Um, you know, at a disadvantage if they don't have these uh, skills developed over time and develop their own way of teaching as well because everybody, every teacher, I think, wants to put their own personal twist on stuff. So with this model for actually as a, you know, it was developed mainly as well to help teachers uh, be successful from day one and gradually become more and more successful in their teaching. And to tell them, okay, the students have these sources of difficulty. So if you're mindful of those, you can design activities that the students will actually uh, succeed at. When teachers see their students succeeding, that's inherently motivating for the, for the teachers themselves. They say, oh, that went great. Okay, let's go and do the next awesome thing. Um, as opposed to when teachers try something and it absolutely flops, there's nothing more demotivating than that, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's sort of where this crosses over into the realm of teacher. Um, in the dynamic stage, there's the quiz is actually there pretty solidly. Technological difficulty for the quiz, though, is perhaps a little disproportionately high and requires a little bit more handholding for teachers. But otherwise, um, even from a teaching perspective as well, uh, the Sudsy model tends to hold up fairly well in terms of scaffolding teacher acquisition of ed tech. When you're talking about getting teachers up to scratch and, and scaffolding their learning so that then they can, they can perform at their best in the classroom, um, did you find that um, there was, I don't know, call it hesitation or, or a hindrance, but like um, you work mostly with Moodle, right? You're... Yes. Um, I don't know if your school, uh, like some universities were saying, no, we don't want you using Zoom or we don't want you using specifically this. You have to use this or that. But um, your school was already in, well, because of you, was mostly based in Moodle. But did you find that when you were talking to other teachers that they had a little bit of a hesitancy <clears throat> to, to look at other um, uh, uh, bits of software like Moodle because they were stuck on Teams or they were stuck on uh, Manaba? Uh, was there a, a, a tendency to basically wall yourself off because you were so afraid of having to go through any more um, of a learning curve with different stuff? Uh, mm -hmm. Did you find that that was, that was difficult or is that a, a, a wall that you had to sort of break through too? Um, sort of, yes. And it's very multifaceted though. Uh, so all the teachers who were reluctant to uh, adopt the Moodle, for example, they had their different reasoning uh, for that. Some had actually hand-coded websites with their educational materials on there uh, to make it available to the students. And they'd, they'd put hours and hours of effort into building up their own system of how they're going to interact with students online. And that's an investment they don't really want to just you know, say, okay, well, that's done. Um, when you're that invested in, in a project, you, you really want to hold on to it. And there was reluctance for that reason. Uh, other people were more interested in trying to use uh, Microsoft and Microsoft Teams. Um, although that, at my university anyway, I don't think that ever really took hold um, to any great degree. It's just perhaps showing videos via Microsoft Stream or something and accessing it via Teams. 
but beyond that, I don't think it really took off. Um, when I arrived first, uh, there was none of these were on the on the horizon, and the university itself didn't have a a university wide uh, e learning system. So actually, in my in my interview, I basically said, you know, if you hire me, I will Moodleify this place. And I'll provide all of these tools that um, and make them, you know, available as a, a, a great collaborative project where we can all get, um, we can all grab the, the the goodies that are online education and use that to supplement and uh, enhance our teaching at the university. They, other people, definitely did not um, like any technology, any ed tech at all. Mm they're the ones that are kind of harder to talk to about it yeah, because yeah, would, they yeah. ideologically hate technology. Um, and yeah, those people exist. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I, oh, I meet them. I meet them. I meet them. Yeah. 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 But uh, even at a science and technology university, which is a little odd, but, but that uh, is, yeah, that's a weird place for those people to be. Yeah. 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 But it's, uh, you know, they, they, each person who has some reluctance has their own reason for it. And, it's so complex. There's um, that's the reason why there's no one solution to help uh, all of these people come across to Moodle, for example, because they've all got different reasons why they're not. And so when when we did start it up, we planned it at the university to make sure that everybody could come across whenever they were ready. And we did that by uh, I engaged the help of my colleagues with the, in the English teaching. English is a, a compulsory subject across the board. So we got all of the English teachers to use Moodle. Great. Now that means in four years time, all of the students will have Moodle experience. And then all the other teachers, when they want to come on board, they just have to tell the students it's on iLearn. That's what we named it. It's on iLearn. And if they just say that one phrase, the students know how to get the, get the contents. Mm. So it was, yeah, we did, we did try to make it as easy as possible for people to uh, come on board with Moodle, but everybody had different reasons for not. And the ones who didn't have any reasons, they basically jumped on board straight away. Uh, for the people that you're trying to help along, um, those that you're sort of pushing up the scaffold, um, do you have a particular strategy in terms of like taking, I don't know, maybe sometimes you've had cases where people are, who actually ask you for help, but are kind of obstinate about getting it. Um, or um, uh, do you have a particular strategy or a flow of approach to getting people uh, or educators uh, up to snuff to some degree uh, with ed tech? Uh, sure. So the, the, the wonderful term for it is actually from Todd Buchans, uh, my friend, who also runs the LO.org thing. Hi, Todd. And um, he coined the term frictionless access like that. Uh, and that's basically what we've, we've tried to do everywhere is we've said, okay, uh, enrolling your students in the course. Okay. You make the course on Moodle. That's all you have to do. Your students will automatically be enrolled. Backups are automatically taken everything. You just have to focus on teaching. That's it. Frictionless access. Students will frictionless have frictionless access to your content as well. Um, so we just try to make it in there as uh, simple as possible. Regarding uh, future desires of professors, because often university teachers want to do some sort of special thing. They want to use a plugin in Moodle, for example, mm. and installation of plugins. Well, a lot of admins take the default position of no, because it's a security, blah, 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 no, blah, whatever. They make up some excuse. Um, Sorry out there, guys, but I don't think that's uh, cool. Yeah, and I agree with him. Um, so so I, we have the, uh, I, I decided just as, as uh, administrative policy to actually say, okay, the goal is to support the teachers in what the teachers need to do. So we're going to do that. And the default position on the request, any requests for plugins, for example, is yes. Now, if I have a good reason not to install a, a given plugin, I need to argue that case. The burden of proof for, okay, why this can't be, that, that falls on the admin, mm -hmm. right? If I can't install a plugin, I need to make a good case as to why. 
And if I can't make a good case, it installs. So support the, um, support the teachers in whatever they need. Um, these sorts of things are also essential for getting, uh, well, teacher buy-in. And it's amazing. The, the effect of that as well is pretty well felt when some teacher requests a feature, you add it and say, there it is, go for it, enjoy. And the response is, oh, yeah, you know, this guy's on our team. <laughs> And they, they, um, their, their motivation again to go in and make it as best as it can be is just doubled by that. So I, I do find that there is a lot, uh, and even uh, probably um, if I read between the lines and what Louise is writing, says, yay for approving plugins, Adam, um, <laughs> that uh, probably a lot of teachers like us, uh, more than likely, most of the people who watch this show every week are, are members of OTJ and thus are a little bit more uh, ed tech savvy than um, probably the average um, university educator in Japan. And um, for those of us who, who know about plugins, um, have encountered resistance from administrators or um, maybe even, you know, the, the dean of the faculty, when you say, well, we, I actually think it'd be really good if we could mark up PDFs or, or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the, 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 what's out of the box in Moodle. But um, when they ask for a particular feature uh, at one university, uh, because of protocol, I have to ask the, the, the head of the department before he will actually talk to the IT department. That's the chain of protocol there. And um and uh, it, it's an immediate no. No, they're too busy for that. And, and no, they're, they're not going to be able to handle that. The, I think we don't need that. We've been doing fine without that. Um, when I'm dealing with that, uh, just I, I sort of know how to handle it. But I'm, there are other people who might be thinking, how do I get past that barrier? You, from your point of view, as both an educator and an assistant administrator, what would be the best thing for a sort of like a, a, an in-the-trenches teachers like me to be able to sell them on the idea that it's worth the effort. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, or there isn't one. <laughs> I think, yeah. I mean, Bill White just also wrote in the in the chat: an administrator's job is the, always to make the teacher's job easier. Well, that okay. I mean, that's okay. Ideal world, but um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's that's kind of what it's about. People. I think have lost the they've lost the track on that. They, they've they've um, I mean the IT guys sometimes I think get the impression that oh my job is to do as little work as possible or <laughs> to make as few changes as possible because if it ain't broke. But the thing they're not getting is it's broken. If if your teachers are not able to do what they need to be able to do. It's broken. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it, doesn't really cut it in ed tech because ed tech's an evolving field. There are always new things coming up. And um, oh, yeah, yeah. Dorothy just wrote, fine isn't everyone's goal. Mm. Yeah, getting better all the time, making tomorrow's education better than yesterday's was. Uh, that needs to be the goal. And um, I think. I know some administrators, I do not understand the mindset of denying plugin installations. I, mm. I think those people are essentially negligent. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not doing their jobs properly. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't know how to convince them either. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I maybe you had some kind of magic potion. You had like a, a SAMR model or something. Was, you know, do this, do this, do this. And um, yeah, but they, they also have to, I think the, the, the IT admins have to also feel that they're in a safe enough place to where they can actually do that. And perhaps cool. societally, we haven't created that, but how can we change that? I'm, I'm at a loss for that as well. I think also too, um, one of the things that uh, I was constantly reminded of during uh, the pandemic and OTJ is that everyone is, I, I think it's good to make the assumption that everyone is trying to do their best. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that, um, you know, before you end up with an adversarial relationship with somebody because you made the assumption that they're mm -hmm. that they're out to screw you, which I don't think most people are doing, they're, they're, as you're saying, just trying to cover their asses or trying to get home in time to go make dinner for their kid, uh, I think puts a, a different uh, a, a light on things. Mm -hmm. Um one wanted to ask you uh, because uh, this is the other thing that uh, that um, always crossed my mind is why did you end up with the knowledge that you did based on open source materials? Why didn't you, you know, be, as you were moving towards becoming a, a, a tech guru, why didn't you glom on to uh, to Windows? Why didn't you glom on to Macintosh? Why did you why did you end up in the open source community? Because uh, I'm cheap. <laughs> That makes sense. And also, I've, I've, I can attest to that. <laughs> I mean, it's cold and you're still only wearing one one shirt, you know, or you don't yeah, have I don't else. want to waste money on jackets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, no, in, it, partly the cheap thing is because cheap, if, if you use open source kind of stuff, then it's freely available all the time forever. Um, there's nobody can actually take Moodle away from me. And um, you know, looking at you, Ed Moto. Um, the guys on Ed Moto, yeah, it's free and everything, but it wasn't open source. So when Ed Moto said, that's it, we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> what, now, what are you going to do? What's, what's the response? It's, 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 oh, suck it up, buttercup. That's all you got. Or you can pay, right? Which is what well, the model is. Or you actually, your school can pay. You can't pay yeah, yourself. Yeah. They, they went to institutional only. So the institution can choose to pay, but if the institution doesn't, you're still, you, you have no freedom to uh, continue going on using this platform you have. Nobody can take Moodle away from me. Not Martin Dugiamas himself can take it away from me because it's released under GNU GPL. That's, it's licensed out. So if somebody, if, if Martin Dugiamas did suddenly tomorrow have some sort of a, a crazy, I don't know, interaction with the aliens from Mars and shut down Moodle. Within five minutes, it would probably be forked to a different thing and they'd call it something else like uh, Tree of Life or something. And, and then Tree of Life would be, it'd be the exact same tools, the exact same code base and everything, it'd be called something different. This has happened time and time again in the open source community. Uh, it would be, you know, uh, open office used to be the, the open version, right. open source version of, of right. office. And then that was acquired by Sun Microsystems, acquired by uh, Oracle. And around about that time, um, people didn't like the direction Oracle was trying to steer it. So they forked it. Boom. Now we've got LibreOffice. Mm. Mm. Right? No one can take it away from you. And if you want to change it and do different things with it, develop new plugins, new functionality, you're totally free to do that. That complete freedom is a freedom that only comes with open source software. Let me direct you to a comment that uh, Chiuki just popped into the uh, the Zoom chat. Anything new is terrifying. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because that's something that we talked about a bit before with scaffolding ed tech. And, uh, and I think for students as well too, the idea that, oh no, this teacher wants me to use Flipgrid, but I hate computers. Um, how do you, address that kind of um, raw emotional sort of reaction, either from teachers or from students uh, to, to get them on their way. Okay, Dorothy followed up pretty much taking the words out of my mouth, uh, <laughs> especially if there is time pressure. So the thing that people I think are most afraid of is not the ed tech itself or the new thing itself, so much as how much time of my life is this gonna steal from me? Yes. <laughs> you know, if I need to learn this, is this going to save me time or is it going to waste my time? And so the way to actually deal with that, I find, is to uh, highlight how much time can be saved. All right, you put this online, your students get it, you know, this PDF, just drag and drop it in there, boom, all the students have access to it. Now you don't have to go to the copy machine, you don't have to make copies, you don't have to distribute them in class. You've saved all that time. And it took you two minutes. You spent two minutes and saved 20. That's uh, sort of how you you get beyond that. It's show that it's actually um, you know, a little bit at a time as well. That's where the scaffolding thing comes in. You, see, you don't dump everything on the shoulders in the one hit. You just say, yeah, look, if you do this, it can save you time this way. And then they'll notice that, yeah, that was true. Okay, how else can it save me time? 
how else can it save me energy? How else can it enhance the educational environment for my students? Um, I think that's the way to go through it. I want to ask Adam just a couple more questions here, uh, and but I've already unmuted or I've given everyone the ability to unmute themselves and I want to remind you that um, uh, question time, probably a bunch of you have some specific questions to ask Adam on any topic um, uh, that you like about uh, open source or Moodle or um, his ideas on educational technology. Um, but um, we were talking about open source a little bit earlier and the idea of um, just getting out there and just getting and helping people and making sure that everything is distributed. Um, I. I cannot stress enough that when people say, oh, Jose, you've done so much for OTJ, and especially with the summer sessions, you did a great job on that, Jose. And I can't stress enough that um, that all of that would have been impossible had it not been, and I don't even want to say Adam backing me up. Um, I did all of that with Adam side by side. Um, Adam just um, didn't want to, uh, uh, I think at the time, to, to be in the spotlight. But without Adam, um, we couldn't have even come up with the idea that was central to how we organized um, the entire OTJ Summer Sessions, which is the idea of a moose, a massive open online session, uh, which is similar to a MOOC, uh, mm -hmm. uh, except we just take out the C and drop in an S. And um, speaking about open source earlier, did you feel that, um, you know, when we were coming up and it, it seemed so organic, the whole idea of a moose, and I'll, I'll throw the, um, that into the share, I'll let you talk about it a bit, but did you find that um, your earlier ideas and experience with open source software um, helped or inspired a few of the ideas that we came up with in the moose? Yeah, I, I would absolutely say so. Uh, in particular, the idea of openness, that uh, it's the, the community is open to make the changes that they want to see. Uh, handing off of control, not, not controlling stuff, not vetting and controlling and being the, pe the people who say what happens, but to hand that off to the open community and let them make their own decisions. Uh, I think that, that that liberating aspect of it was very much... Uh, in my mind and and this moose document as well was because i think that people didn't quite get how much control they had over it mm. and so we had to actually explicitly uh announce that that hey this is not a traditional conference where you have a couple of guys at the top making all the calling all the shots um it's the community that has it and that openness is I and mean, that's our number one core value value on the screen right now and openness and distributed organization, everybody comes in and do, does their own thing. Uh, that was very much in, influenced by um, MOOCs and uh, open source mindsets mm. of give everybody the freedom to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. so. Those first three um, uh, parts mm. of, the, uh, of the definition came specifically from you. Uh, the uh, openness, distributed organization, mutual respect and acceptance. And um, and when we were talking about all of that, it, I, it, it told me that like, yeah, this is pretty cool. I, I really like this whole new paradigm that um, that we tried to uh, put together. I, I, I do wish though that um, it doesn't disappear eventually and that uh, other conference organizers try it but it is difficult i mean it, it chewed up all of our time basically uh every summer for 2020 and 2021 <laughs> uh, do you think that um or what if we were i i know that i say that we're never going to do it again but if we were to do it again um it what could we do to make it actually easier so that then we can pass it off to people and say, well, you know, learn from what we did and this is how we made it easy or, or a less hard. <laughs> I don't think it's ever going to be easy. Well, well, this year, this uh, past September, we did the uh, Bridging the Gaps uh, event. Mm. And in that one, we, rather than um, hacking a, a WordPress site to actually do, the, do our bidding, we actually used a system called Pretalks, which is an open source conference management system. And that did all the heavy lifting. Um, and at the end, after the, the event was over, it was able to be you know, uh, distilled down to 
just a, a set of HTML pages. It's, it now has no login anymore. It is just uh, the archive of what went on. Hmm. Uh, sorry, I'm just look. Go using, ahead. Sorry, using systems like that, using systems that are designed by other people in our situation, but they have more coding chops and they just do it and make it open source and available for everybody. Uh, that makes your life a lot easier. So, mm. Um, mm. and of course, if it doesn't do what you need it to do, like um, this particular uh, pre talks, it didn't initially have the ability for me to just stick those slippers in, for example, and, <laughs> and images and things like that were a little bit tricky, but it's open source. So of course I can go back to the source and change stuff. I am free to do so. It's encouraged that I do so. So I did so. So that I think makes it a lot easier than trying to shoehorn a conference into a, a WordPress site or something like that. And WordPress is open source too. So you can actually get away with it. And we did for two years, but to make it easier, if something is purpose built for that purpose, your starting place is a little bit further along where you, towards where you need to get. And um, open source for the people who there might be somebody in the audience who eventually watches us on YouTube who uh, thinks open source, what's that? Uh, it's not impossible, uh, but uh, open source itself. Um, seriously, there is a way to save money uh, using open source software. So if you're, if you're looking at the idea of like um, um, spending, I don't know, whatever you have to spend of it's uh, 200,000 yen, hundred thousand yen, getting a, a summer's license to uh, to conference software, come talk to us. Uh, we, we actually uh, figured out a, a way to do it specifically Adam did. And then he told me to just get out of the way while well, he did it. Um, quick word, Adam on uh, what's coming up with uh, Moodle four. And then uh, maybe we can get to people's questions. I'm sure that the idea of Moodle 4 coming is going to get people going, oh, Moodle 4? There's a, there's a Moodle 4 coming? And uh, those questions will start coming at you. But uh, maybe just a quick one on that. What what are we uh, looking forward to? Or uh, yeah, can use now? Just, just before moving on, though, I might just highlight that there are two types of free in open source software. This is true. One is free in terms of price, money, free beer. in terms of beer. Uh, that They usually say it, free in terms of beer, beer and free in terms of freedom. Um, so both are actually pretty good when you're when you're a, an, a, an organization like OTJ that has no budget. Uh, free in terms of beer is good because we don't have any budget. And free in terms of freedom to do what we need to do with the software is also essential because we can't buy a bespoke solution. Yeah, We need to um, tweak it the way we are. So both of those freedoms were important for what we were doing with the uh, OTJ summer sessions and the Bridging the Gaps conference. Correct. Okay, on to Moodle 4 though. Yes. Uh, Moodle 4 actually came out in, I think it was April, late April. I believe so, yeah. Um, so it's actually there. Uh, the big thing is that they actually finally gave the user interface a massive overhaul and they've changed the way that Moodle is used. So now I've got to re-record all of my Moodle videos. Um, but <laughs> the, the, the good news is that it's a lot more intuitive than it used to be. Uh, I had actually some teachers come up to me and, and say, I've had at least two actually now, who've come up to me and said, oh, I see that Moodle has been powered up. And oh, a few more actually emailed me just yesterday. But yeah, um, they've said, oh, it, it's powered up. It's, it's, it's becoming stronger and better and everything. Great. Thanks a lot. Great work and everything. I just, I just did the updates. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> anyway, he's, it's uh, much more intuitive now. So people are finding it less need for a, uh, a manual to tell them how to do stuff. They can just intuit that uh, for themselves. Unfortunately, there is a bit of a double-edged sword to that because the people who who are used to doing it the old way are finding it sometimes difficult to find where the new place is. Very once, true. Once you look in there and you go, yeah, that makes sense. Um, that's where it is. Okay. But uh, I don't know, the old dogs are now finding it harder than the new guys. Well, because, you know, that's the, uh, I think some people too get confused about what is better as opposed to what I'm used to. Hmm. 
Uh, it was better the old way. No, it wasn't necessarily better the old way. You just knew where those buttons were. And um, and I got to admit, I fall into that trap a bit, uh, thinking that, oh, no, it was better the old way. Let's go back to the old way. And it wasn't necessarily better. It's just that you knew it better. Uh, I would, however, again, encourage everyone, either turn on your cameras or start throwing your questions out. Uh, there's there's actually a separate discussion, actually. It's one of those Zoom meetings where there's a separate discussion happening in chat. And I'd like to get that up uh, onto the um uh, into uh, the uh, the actual recording itself, because remember, everybody, this goes on YouTube, and uh, that chat doesn't go in there. So the discussion about updates and um, uh, IT guys not addressing the needs of the teachers, or maybe, I don't know, I think there was a mention about um, language issues as well. Maybe we can bring that up here, if people about bring up their... Um, uh, their cameras and maybe uh, aim their questions to uh, to Adam himself. But um, Adam, you're fluent in Japanese, yeah? Uh, I like to think so, yeah. Do you find that um, language, especially when you're talking about Moodle itself being basically an English English language based open source community, uh, was that a, a difficult sell uh, for your your Japanese university? Um, well, Moodle's pretty well translated into Japanese now. We've got about the instructions those, and stuff too. Uh, the instructions, yeah. They, they one of the instructions. I think the the one that threw me the most was uh, the number of people who've requested it be in a book. Um, is wait, wait, is there a book I can read? A book? I want to read a book. And it's just wait, wait, six months go by, your book's out of date. Um, I mean, I I recall that this book kind of needs an update. Hi, Dorothy. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the idea of a book, and I was thinking, okay, um, show them how to do it with, you know, screen captures and, and screen capture videos and things like that. Surely that's going to be uh, better and easier. For a lot of people, totally was. But n not an insignificant number of people said, no, I want it on paper. I want it in a book. And some people actually said, you know, I want it on paper so I can have the paper beside my, my computer monitor and look at that while I'm doing it. Yes. <laughs> wow, that, that struck me as a, a, a strange way to consume information about ed tech. But, um, it's a strange um, way to consume trees as well. It's, too, it's not the way I do it. So yeah. that's why that, that was kind of surprising, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did let's I see. actually answer your question? You, yes, you did. But I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep up. With, like there's, there's like an entirely different show happening in the chat right now. Um, Kevin, uh, Kevin Ryan. I don't know if you're, you're able to actually uh, show your, your handsome face on camera. Yep, but, I'm um, here. Yeah, there you are, buddy. Um, why don't you uh, let's let's try to bring this uh, conversation over uh, into into the main room here. Um, and you made a point about the Moodle organization uh, in Japan, mostly being in English, and then there was a, a bit of a shift. I don't know if you want to comment on that yourself on your mic right now. Well, just uh, going over the years, uh, past three or four or five years, uh, there's been uh, more Japanese presentations at the Moodle organization, the annual conference that we have. And so I think, yeah, there's, there's uh, the adoption rate uh, here in Japan is really going up. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, at, at the uh, Moodle Association of Japan, I was until recently the director of training there. And we tried to guarantee that every year at the Moodle uh, Association of Japan's Moodle Moot, that there would be a stream of English workshops and a stream of Japanese workshops. And ideally, both a beginner stream and an advanced stream in both languages. Mm -hmm. uh, but we prioritize the beginner stream uh, because that's how you get new users, is right. you, you help the beginners come in. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the, the advanced users, they can just sit around and drink some coffee and exchange notes, share notes later. <laughs> and they do do that. So it's, it's not as essential as the beginner workshops. But we did try to make sure, we made a concerted effort uh, to make sure that that was in Japanese as well. One specific thing that um, we might uh, be able to talk about here and hopefully get it on to, um, to the video for the archives is um, what if you've convinced me, Adam, Moodle is the way to go, open source, great idea, great, uh, great concept. Um, and I'm actually willing to go up and get my own server uh, because the, the university is being, um, you know, um, just a brick wall about staying with Manaba or staying with the LMS that they already have, what would be the investment? And would it be worth it on my part to actually go and set up 
um, a Moodle installation on my own. Mm. Um, or my school. I mean, there's some school owners out there who might actually be able to make good use of this. It, it sort of depends on how convinced you are. Um, and also your personality type. If you're a tinkerer, if you're a person who likes to go under the hood and do their own oil changes and stuff like that, yeah, um, you're, you buckle up because you're in for an awesome ride. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of stuff to learn. I, I was such a tinkerer and am still such a tinkerer personality type. So when I was confronted with problems, I said, oh, that's something else I can learn about. And, and bang, it was exciting. It was thrilling uh, to solve each problem as it, as it popped up. Uh, other people get irritated by that and feel, ah, oh, it's an endless game of whack-a-mole. So it, it really depends on what sort of a person you are. If you're going to um, get Moodle yourself, yes, you have great freedom to do whatever you want. But you also will encounter problems. And if those problems are incredibly frustrating, yeah, maybe it's not for you. Maybe one of these other solutions like Google Classroom or you know, Teams is a better fit with you. Um, so, but if you, yeah, if you are a tinkerer and if you don't mind going and, and getting your hands dirty a bit and, and actually getting the service set up, the financial investment, you could, it can start as low as something like, uh, Linode's what, $5 a month. I think probably, uh, uh is yeah, the lowest $6, year. I think it was $6. And so that's 6,000 yen a year, uh, plus yeah. maybe 1,000 yen. So, uh, ah, each of my in all up for the domain yeah. name and everything. And you could have a fully functional Moodle that will do you good for at least 50 students. Um, you could probably, you know, as long as they're not all logging in at the same time, you could probably have upwards of, you know, 200, 300 easily comfortably on your own Moodle. But yeah, it's, um, if you're interested in doing that, by the way, come along to a Moodle moot, uh, visit Bill White's page. Uh, Bill, Bill, can you put a, a, a link or something up? That'd be good. You there, Bill? Um, <laughs> Or and, come and join us on OTJ Moodle as yeah, well, too. Because Bill has actually written a full website about how to set up your own Moodle and, and things like that. So you don't have to. And I've done videos on it in the past as well. Um, and if you have any problems, you're not helpless. Go to the community. Go to the Moodle Association of Japan. Go to OTJ Moodle and ask questions and get the answers you need uh, and enjoy, enjoy the trip. Thanks, Bill. Bill Sensei dot X Y Z. Also, too, if anyone has any questions outstanding from the original or the original, the earlier uh, discussion that we had about uh, Sazi or Samer, uh, those are very eye-opening to me when um, Adam showed them to me. And as I said, we're going to be discussing that um, at um, at uh, Matsuyama Jolt mm. next week. It's next week, isn't it? Yeah, it's creeping up on us. That's for sure. Yeah, thank you very much to uh, to uh, to Linda. She's actually in the audience, isn't she? Mm. Linda, uh, Linda is there. I can't mm. see her name. Yep, I see Linda. Oh, K. yeah, there she is, Linda K. Yeah, because I'm always looking for Linda Cadota. But uh, thanks to Linda for that. If you guys can tune into that, I'm I'm hoping to actually put that up as a hybrid um, uh, a hybrid uh, event uh, here on Zoom as well too. Mm. Um. What's uh, what's in store for you, Adam? Besides the Matsuyama uh, Jolt conference, what else is happening? And where are the questions? <clears throat> no one has any Moodle questions. <laughs> well, you all you all became experts or something. Uh, what's 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 in the cards for you in terms of what's uh, what's next you're, you're doing there in terms of presentation um, stuff? Well, I am trying to expand the the Japanese uh, language support for. Moodle and Moodle for Education. So starting off with the Sudsy model and I'm trying on, I, so I have two YouTube channels, one in English, one in Japanese. And I'm particularly targeting the Japanese one for this, but to have the Sudsy model gradually take, uh, make videos of uh, how to actually uh, put, add a file, add a, add a book module and edit different pages and then make a quiz and do all of these things um step-by-step -step videos all the way through so that the japanese community has that sort of a, a knowledge base um that's currently the biggest project i'm i'm working on at the moment with the hope that afterwards after i've got these all up in video and organized as ideas to perhaps turn that into a book Ooh. because so many people are asking for a book Ooh, i i know somebody who who's in books mm. uh, that's the english language one 
<laughs> oh well oh my god so it's it's bilingual that's fantastic and and if you think my uh, my video production value is very cheap it's because it is it is very cheap. well no i shouldn't um, say that e everything there is recorded in a single take uh because i don't have time for video editing <laughs> so. but it uh, the, beyond that the information is all there the guy knows what he's talking about uh for those of you who um who want to know about moodle and can can concentrate for a little while uh, on on the information that's coming at you. Adam presents it uh, in a, in a very uh, a likable, knowledgeable, uh, easy to digest way. Uh, there's information there about Moodle four, about um, about uh, databases, running your databases, maybe doing a little bit of coding sometimes too with PHP. Adam basically knows about all of this stuff as it relates to Moodle and as it relates probably even to the. Um, the edu do you talk about more just move do you talk about your your ed tech scaffolding and, and your ed tech ideas as well too in there um in there yeah uh so the ed tech scaffolding would be more on the japanese side at the moment so yeah the the sudzi model is introduced uh in japanese and it's the basis for you know i'm going to be talking about the static one first and the the dynamic one second uh, and so on and so on so it's it's definitely a big part of it, but it's that's mostly on the Japanese one. Mm, mm. Uh, I was noticing also just something that made me chuckle a little bit was short upgrade video promise, and it was like twenty three minutes long. <laughs> so, what is it, which, which, OTJ which shorties also are. Where is it? Short upgrade video. Where is that? Uh, the second one. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Uh, twenty. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like twenty four minutes long. Yeah, well, you you. For those of you who have never tried to actually make explanatory videos, you will find when you think, oh, this will only take five minutes, that it actually does take 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, just to even get to the point of where you're, okay, now that I've told you about the background to the issue, oh, mm -hmm. guess what? I'm, I'm 12 minutes in already. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so try it yourself first, uh, mm -hmm. which is something that I would probably tell all of those IT administrators and bureaucrats when they say, no, no, there's nothing wrong with our system. Mm -hmm. You don't need a plug-in. No, no. But it, it shows just how how lazy I am when it comes to editing because I I made the the title card before I made the video, recorded the video. Oh, it's twenty four minutes long, and I just yeah, I'm not changing that card. <laughs> it's it, look, look <laughs> it's, it's not two hours long. It's it's not three hours long. So relatively speaking, it is a short upgrade video. So yeah. um, relative to an entire lifetime, sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, which I have uh, now experienced for sixty years, and I don't know why that crossed my mind or why I even said that out loud. But, uh, uh, saw the one with the pirate hat and eye patch. Mm -hmm. right. Oh yeah, pirate hat and the eye patch is fun. Okay. Um, no <laughs> questions, but if you guys have any questions, um, I don't have anything more left to say, and I'm gonna have to like um, either I you know, see. I like see maybe, one shut this down you guys have an expert right in front of you he's in a good mood to answer your questions you gotta have something you want to ask yeah. well chiyuki asked why did i name it wise cat ah that's a good one that's, um, a, that's actually i don't know the answer to that question uh so in terms of frictionless access i wanted to have a fairly short url something that doesn't take half an hour to type um so it's actually one of the things Online teaching Japan.com, I find incredibly annoying to type. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. so I, I didn't want a long one. And the short, good ones are pretty much all taken. So I'm just searching one after another and after another. And at the time, I had a cat. And so I thought, okay, wisdom cat, okay, wise cat.net. It's available. Cool. Yoink, mine. And that was it. There um, you go. Seriously, just about anything I do, just a not much thought goes into it. <laughs> it's just no wonder we ended up doing OTJ summer sessions. Glenn, what's your question? Well, I had typed it in there. I guess it just got lost with all the other short messages. Well, a lot of but stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's just a super basic question. Since I'm now part time and teaching at different universities, I may sometimes want to know what version of Moodle they've got. Mm. There may be various reasons for that. How does somebody know? How do you go in and check? Uh, if they have the help at the bottom of the page, there's um, often there's a little question mark at the bottom of the page. Uh, you can look in there and if you then go to 
help and documentation or additional documentation from there, that'll link to the Moodle.org page, help page for that, which will in the URL have 3.8 or 3.9 or 3.11 or 4.1 or whatever the, ver the version number is. And so as where a, is this as an uh, image, initial help? Yeah, so Moodle docs for this page. That's the one. Right there. See that, Glenn? Yeah. I see it. Um, is that okay, present just, on just every Moodle, Moodle page? Yeah. And in the URL, or, or actually there it says 3.9 docs. So that would be 3.9. Uh, that's present as long as the actual Moodle docs links have not been removed by the uh, admin. Okay. So that can be found on virtually any page within a Moodle site? Usually, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. You're quite welcome. Hmm. They, they don't vary so much, though, right, Adam? From 3.9 to 3.10 to 3.10.11. Hmm. They, they don't vary that much, right? Yeah. They're, occasionally, you'll have something huge. Like the difference between 3.11 and 4.0 is huge. Uh, the difference between 2.3 and 2.4 was also huge, but more huge under the hood than it was in terms of user interface. So, but yeah, they gradually go along. Um, that actually is another thing, admin side of things. Uh, I always try to upgrade on a regular schedule every six months, um, my university's Moodle. And part of the reason is because if you're going from uh 3.9 to 3.10 that's a small change if you go from 3.10 to 3.11 that's a small change uh, but the theme shock of going from say 2.3 to 4.0 would be uh so is this the same site yeah you know, mm. people wouldn't is be able the to same software up. and so that's something I've, I've sometimes referred to as theme shock because the theme often also changes and it's shocking to the users and it's it can jar people out of Moodle use. To reduce uh, a little bit of that theme shock, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to prognosticate, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. either you or the other two um, Moodle experts here. People don't <clears throat> notice. Uh, Kevin and Bill are both Moodle experts as well, too. Uh, what do you see coming up for Moodle uh, past the four release? Um, any new things that we can be looking at, something um, in terms of um, higher interactivity or uh, maybe AR, VR, any talk about that going on in the Moodle circles? What, what do you see coming down the pipeline? Um, yeah, so the, the 4.0 release is likely to have a new version of the question bank, which will make it a bit more, well, it'll make it significantly easier to share small, you know, just say this category of questions this this bunch of questions i want to share these with jose it'll make it a lot easier for me to just download those and send them to you as a as a file uh perhaps sharing across the site as well will be easier uh that's something that geekily gets me very excited uh but uh so also sharing cart for example sharing cart used to be uh up until now has been that if you share a quiz the entire course's question bank must be copied over, mm. which if you only want these 20 questions, why do you have to copy a thousand? Exactly. That's, yeah. that's, that's pointless. that's going to be fixed in 4.1, fingers crossed. So uh, when that gets fixed, that's going to be a lot better. And those sorts of things are going to make sharing easier. The other thing on the sharing side is Moodle net um, connecting teachers to a full on courseware sharing community. That's that's the big thing that's uh, I think is on the horizon. Is um, I think Martin Meadows just actually built a uh, a Moodle Net instance that he's um, testing now to actually have Moodle Associates in Japan have its own instance of Moodle Net. Uh, the mothership version it's just Moodle.net, but uh, is the address. But that allows you to collate and curate and share open courseware resources online. Uh, that's gonna be awesome, I think. Bye, Gretchen. So if you're, oh, thank you, Gretchen. Uh, if you are, uh, for example, teaching a course and you're, you've are you got the topic of uh, what happened last week in uh, um, uh, Sweden or something like that, and somebody actually has already made uh, content about that and actually updated, uploaded that to MoodleNet, well, with one click, you can get that sent to your Moodle and put in your course. 
Mm. And so people can share their open courseware much, much easier. Mm. There was always ways to do it before, but yeah, it was pretty clunky. Glenn, what's your next one? Um, I tried to look at uh, a Moodle page from the standpoint of a student, especially a first year student. They click on it, they open it up, and there's just this massive, small text font size, whole bunches of lines of material there for the student to see. It's, it's cluttered for them, no matter how many folders you use to compact things. But I don't think there's much of a way to get around that. What I was thinking, though, is when I'm showing my pages to students, and I've had uh, you know various items in there hidden from them, the students can still see it when they're looking at what I'm showing, mm. I, I believe. So they're seeing stuff that normally I would be the only one to see. So let's say I'm going down the page and I say, okay, here's your homework after this particular link. Mm. But I've got three hidden items above that. So I don't know if that confuses the students, but is there possibly a way to truly hide that from the students so that when we're displaying it to them, they don't see that stuff? Uh, Other than they, going into student mode. <laughs> when, when they look at it logged in, um, it tends not to be seen. But the, the, the simplest way, if you really want to see what the students see completely, make yourself a student account and log in as that student account. There's there's nothing beats that in terms of it. The, the switch to role to student is pretty good, but it's not perfect. Well, um, how do you how do you make yourself a private or mock student account, especially if you're a part-time teacher? Uh, if you're a part-time teacher, you ask the administrator to help you out with that. Um, this is the sort of thing that you can only do as an admin. Yeah, I found that to be an extremely useful tool to have this mock student thing. Mm -mm. I would be using my iPad, for example, to see what the students would see and my base computer to see what I as a teacher want. Ideally, uh, if you can actually ask your admin to actually make it and say, enroll this student, this mock student in all of my classes as well, then you would have uh, full access to that. Uh, I think Eric Hagler used to do it using the name Deno. Gakse. <laughs> that was very cute too. But, um, but there's no substitute for that, unfortunately. No. Anyone else have a question for Adam? Uh, can I, I ask one? Go, Kev, go yeah, I, I'm curious about uh, your adoption uh, into your university. And you, you used the English, not the English department, but the English staff and faculty to kind of get into the university and then it spread from there. Um, it was, did, did that put any kind of special burden on, on the English department? Did, was there any kind of reaction from the student that said, oh, you know, it's just like we have to use this Moodle thing uh, until they learned it? Uh, and is there some other way to do it? What perhaps gra gathering a team of one person from each department and using them as as uh, evangelists for, for mm -hmm. Moodle? Uh, so the reason we did the first time, the first year English classes in particular was because we wanted coverage over the entire student body. Uh, we figured that it's not really good if you say, if you say to all the, stu the uh, teachers, okay, you can use this Moodle course and most of your students will know how to access it. Not so cool. Most of your students will have an easy time accessing your materials if it's on this system. Uh, it just misses the mark. If you say all of your students know how to access it because they've all experienced this with their English course. It doesn't have to be an English course. It could be freshman seminar or something like that. But as long as you've got that 100% coverage of your students, where well, your students all have experienced this. So they have that, uh, which now can be considered assumed knowledge. Um, you can't assume it unless you actually put it in. So we just use the fact that English is a compulsory first year subject for every student to say, okay, that's how we get our coverage. Uh, it did actually come with its own challenges because uh, mentally, a lot of professors for a long time thought, oh, that's just language learning software. 
Mm. And they thought that Moodle was mm. specifically geared towards language learning. And I guess there are a lot of tools that are specifically really good for language learning type stuff, like crosswords and stuff like that. But you know, trying to convince people that, yeah, it can go beyond that. Look at this mathy thing I'm doing. And so in order to actually demonstrate that, I actually created a course in trigonometry on mm. the Moodle and showed it uh, to demonstrate, that, look what you can do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that trig course, I, I had all the animations and things like that that are also pretty cool because there are some really good animations out there about, you know, radians and things like that, that if you look at the animation for 20 seconds, you've got the concept. And um, so to show them that, okay, rather than spending half an hour explaining this concept to the, your students, you can show them that animation and they've got it in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, that was fairly powerful in, in helping them convince them that, yeah, this isn't just a language learning tool. Right. And saves um, them time. Yeah. The, the other side of that was also, um, we did make a sort of a rule to forbid the use of other e-learning systems that require logins. Uh, because we wanted to make sure that 100% coverage would happen inside. So when other people, when other vendors, uh, JALT conferences and I go around looking at the textbooks and they say, oh, we've got an e-learning system. Oh yeah, do I, can I plug it into my Moodle? No, you can't. Okay, not interested. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's not going to help. Uh, I mean, that means, of course, we can use things like Kahoot's and Quizlet and things that don't require logins. But we, we drew the line at login. If mm -hmm. um, a system requires another login, then uh, please don't use it. And that was designed to reduce the burden on students and so that they're not getting overwhelmed with a thousand different models. Wow, that sounds powerful. <laughs> Open window. Now I can see my tree. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, hmm. Nobody else? We good? Um, probably, you know, at some point, uh, I noticed that uh, Moodle, OTJ Moodle is starting to get a little bit more active. Um, people like Doug Strabel, thank you, Doug, are uh, putting up some really interesting posts up there. And maybe uh, at some point, too, uh, something Moodle specific, not just your own personal thoughts on ed tech and stuff like that, too. Adam, we can maybe do something, uh, uh, another my share. Um, if Bill and mm. Kevin and Doug and I don't know who else would uh, would like to contribute, I'm sure I can scratch up something from the idiot's mm. point of view uh, to contribute to a Moodle my share. Uh, we can do that as well too to talk about more Moodle questions. But I noticed Glenn has another question. Glenn, go ahead. Yeah, I'm the my questions guy. Yeah, we, yep. <laughs> um, I think I saw either on the OTJ Facebook site or somewhere else that in Moodle 4.0 there's a feature where when you first enter your course page it now doesn't show this string of text for each of the uh, the week's mm -hmm. topics it actually has a sort of a, a home page feel to it like a title page mm -hmm. and i don't know if i'm using the right words here but um can you talk about that if i'm off base on it or not because i think it sounded really useful to make students comfortable for entering mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about what Doug posted the other day about having the, the first page, the front page being. That sounds like it. Yeah, whatever that is. I'd like to hear a little more about it. Um, well, that's uh, Doug. If I'm not sure if Doug, do you want to come out and uh, talk about that? Are you unmikeable? Here he comes. Sorry. Yes, I'm here. Um... Hey, Doug. Yeah, I found that very interesting because um, I I wanted to just put up some information just like uh, Glenn mentioned. But uh, what I found, Glenn, is that you can, if you use HTML code or you can actually, um, there's some templates around that you can, you can, you can edit it according to, um, just like the Moodle Alto editor. So you can put video, you can put uh, all of those things that you can put in a course, you can put it up onto uh, that, uh, uh, what is it, the home page? You can create your little home page. But the trick, Adam, the trick, Adam, is where to find that information. That's what was uh, 
the key and I, I, <clears throat> I put it on my little, there's a little video actually that shows it from Moodle on there. Mm. So, but does this require HTML skills? Because not well, a lot of people have them. Well, not, no, it doesn't. Mine does, the one that I did there. Uh, and I've learned how to do that. And actually, uh, there's actually a lot of templates that are around that you can use. So, uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. So, what is this called in case I want to search for those templates? Um, uh, First, I, 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 first I wouldn't go into the HTML templates part. I would just start and put a uh, the banner up there, and then you can put some text, and you can put some videos, and just things that you're familiar with tweaking. You know, I, I tried to go, that's what I started out with, right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. I eventually made it to, to, oh, you can change this to HTML, mm -hmm. and I know where to get a templates and add some things, and mm -hmm. I, I did that, so... Yeah, adding if bits I, and bits by bit by bit is is definitely an awesome way to actually do it. Just don't don't think of it as a whole. Add the banner first, and okay, the banner's here. Good. What's next? What's next? Yes. I, I yes. see Catherine Oksaka has put a link in the chat for a plugin for these format Sorry, titles, plug but plugins. Uh, my, my okay, I'll confess, I'm not currently using Moodle, but my co -work, my coworker using it uses the tiles and the tiles plugin makes it she feels more user friendly because it's not it's, you know because you can uh, you can add icons to some of the tiles to visually differentiate what 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 information you would find when you click on each tile but who is permitted to install these plugins Oh, Adam, Adam talked about that earlier. That has this is the ad, admin. So yeah. that's the admin. Sorry if that's maybe not a, a helpful solution for you. Uh, it's, actually, it Glenn, is, go. I, I would encourage people to, uh, whenever they want something like tiles, ask the admin to add it mm. and keep asking. It's sort of like that thing out of uh, Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, now I'll send them two letters a week. Um, so keep asking, keep asking, because the squeaky wheel will eventually get the grease, I think. Um, <laughs> make it more painful for them not to install it than to install it. Uh, but yeah, the tiles is an awesome plugin uh, to actually change it away from being that big list of stuff into, you know, there are discrete blocks for each week and things like that. And that can make it a lot more interesting uh, to look at visually. Another little um, tidbit for the tiles thing, this goes back to what Kevin was talking about. It was translated into Japanese by the efforts of uh, Martin Meadows through OTJ Moodle, I believe. Um, he got a bunch of people together and said, okay, let's just do this. Let's let's get this translated because uh, somebody said in OTJ Moodle, um, we would like to use the plugin, but our admin's refusing because it hasn't been translated into Japanese. And so Martin Meadows saw that and he was just like, we can change that. <laughs> and now it is, so. If you look, Glenn, it might already be there. It's it's often already put in because it's a very popular plugin. Mm. Um, okay, let's see. It's been a, a an hour and a half here. I don't know if uh, there. Are, I don't see a cavalcade of questions uh, appearing. Um, if there are no others, I want to. Um, tell people about the guest that we're going to have next week. Um, not an OTJ guy, but um, I always thought that he would make a great member of OTJ, but uh, because he's very busy at his job at uh, Kyushu University, being a chemistry teacher, of all things, uh, he teaches chemistry at Kyushu University, and um, he started a YouTube channel to do um, what we call science communication. I thought that um, Andrew Robinson, my buddy Andy would be a really good guest to come on. And he said yes, and he will be here on October 19th on a Wednesday evening. I'm still moving around between Wednesday evenings and Saturdays as I sort of see where my schedule is easier to, uh, to bring guests in and, of course, up to the guests. But um, he has his YouTube channel for science communication where he talks about things like chemistry and how um, chemistry basically affects everything uh, biologically uh, and, uh, and of course, inorganically everything uh, that actually happens almost everything that happens in front of us is uh, is um, something you do with chemistry so uh, Andy's going to be here next week 
and um, other people that are coming up uh, as guests on the show are, are luminaries like Scott Crow, um, uh, Catherine Metamorque. Uh, we're going to have a trio, I hope, uh, between um, uh, Marcos Benavides, Alistair, Alistair Graham Mark, and, and Mark Helgeson talking about publishing. Uh, and uh, and speaking of publishing, Gregory Hadley and Andy Boone will also be coming onto the show probably sometime in in uh, a couple of months to talk about uh, a book that they just published. So I hope you all just keep hanging around. Uh, we're working hard here at OTJ TV to, to make your Saturday mornings a bit more palatable, especially in the case of uh, often Adam, who has a, a hangover to nurse uh, from the Friday <laughs> night social. Uh, so if you're looking for something to do on Friday nights and Saturday mornings, just keep hanging around OTJ. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, for for uh, coming on to the show and giving us a, a little bit of information on Moodle and all of your thoughts on ed education technology. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm going to say goodbye uh, to everybody else for, for, uh, for, for, for the afternoon. Thanks very much. Big wave, everyone. Good night. Drive safe.